<clears throat> Thanks everyone for coming. Today's a big day for us, <clears throat> and we're excited to share it with you. Cancer has been part of life since there was life. Every complex biological organism is made of cells, and those cells have the potential to mutate, which may lead them divide, to divide out of control, eventually killing the organism. Cancer knows no boundaries. It doesn't discriminate. It afflicts people everywhere, regardless of race, ethnicity, class, or religion. In the US, one half of men will get cancer in their lifetime. And one third of women will get cancer in their lifetime. This year, eight million people will die from cancer. And next year, eight million more. Forty years ago, Nixon declared war on cancer, and we made great progress at first. By the 1980s, we could treat half of all cancers with a standard box of tools. Chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, but the other half remain a death sentence. We've spent decades studying cancer, mapping its genome, and discovering targets which could be used to make cancer drugs. It turned out the problem of cancer was more complex than maybe we initially realized. Over the last 20 years, growth in funding exploded. 20 years ago, the toughest cancers were hard to treat. And if innovation had kept up with funding, we should have made progress a lot faster. But 20 years later, patient outcomes have barely improved. Today, new cancer drugs are not measured by patients cured or by increasing survival by years, but rather mere months. Money spent over the last 40 years on cancer research and development has reached at least $300 billion. $300 billion, and that's in the US alone. So clearly, the problem of cancer is not simply a question of resources. It's a question of how we allocate those resources. So how did we get here? How have we spent so much money with so little to show for it? Forty years later, cancer remains as deadly as ever. Researchers mean well, institutions mean well, and funders mean well, but the system is broken somehow. First of all, funding doesn't reward risk-taking. The agencies responsible for funding most scientific research generally don't encourage scientists to pursue their boldest ideas. So we don't get ambitious science. They're instead encouraged to pursue safe bets so we get incremental science. And here's how the system works. <clears throat> First, you have the academic centers. That's the hub where the scientists do their work. Doing studies and gathering data. Theoretically, all in the service of patients. And to keep their work running, scientists constantly have to seek funding from grant-making organizations, especially the National Cancer Institute. But every scientist and every institution has to do this individually. We call this siloization. And then there are the pharmaceutical companies that dr develop drugs, and then there are the regulators who approve those drugs. And if by now you're, th you're thinking the system looks too complicated, you're right. These web-like layers of bureaucracy don't just make it hard for scientists to do the best science, it makes it hard for scientists to do science at all. And as a result of all that, Scientists spend one-third of their time writing grants rather than doing research. But what if we could do things differently? Imagine how hard it would be to get two institutions to collaborate and cooperate in this current system. We would need them to share data, to share intellectual property, to share patient samples, and to run clinical trials together. What if we could get two centers to share all these things? What if the breakthroughs in data at one institution could be used by anyone at the other? What if we could get all of these silos working together? It would be incredibly hard to do this with just uh, two of these institutions, let alone six. But that's exactly what we've done with six of the leading cancer centers in the country. Memorial Sloan Kettering. <clears throat> Stanford Medicine, UCLA, UCSF, 
Ho hometown, hometown hero for a lot of San Francisco people here. Uh, University of Pennsylvania. And the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And today we're announcing the creation of the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy with a $250 million grant from the Parker Foundation. And now let me tell you how it works. <clears throat> Remember that messy system that we have now. We unify the research programs, administration of intellectual property, data collection and management of clinical trials between our six partner centers under the umbrella of a single nonprofit medical research organization. It's made up of the scientific breakthroughs, patient samples, including genomic data, phenotype data, and clinical outcomes, management of clinical trials, and researchers working together. By combining forces with six top cancer research centers, the Parker Institute is able to assemble an all-star team of the best scientists in the field. We empower them with funding, access to technology, and the administrative support they need to be even more successful. Breakthroughs created at one center are immediately available to all scientists within the network. Nearly 400,000 cancer patients walk through the doors of these institutions every year. We are able to streamline the process of opening clinical trials and enrolling patients across multiple institutions simultaneously. This is the result of three years of work with our member researchers and partner centers with the goal of accelerating the process of taking discoveries from bench to bedside. We are placing our big bet on cancer immunotherapy. So why do we choose cancer immunotherapy? Well, first of all, it's dynamic, it's durable, and has the potential to be universal. Until now, the standard of care has been chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Chemotherapy only kills cancer while you're giving it. Radiation kills cancer while it's being administered. And surgery works while you're cutting the cancer out. If any cells escape, cancer will relapse. And when it comes back, it's often developed resistance, meaning it's learned how to evade the next attack. Cancer immunotherapy, on the other hand, leverages your body's own defenses to treat cancer. It's capable of retraining the immune system to identify and kill cancer cells. That's the difference between a static, unchanging attack versus a dynamic attack that can adapt alongside cancer. This is what cures look like. The difference is durability. But the tragedy of immunotherapy is that so, so few people currently have access to it. Today, only about 200,000 of the 13.5 million people with cancer in the US are being treated with immunotherapy. That is less than 1% of cancer patients. We want to change that. Every time I meet a new researcher, I ask them to tell me, what is the most ambitious thing that you want to work on? What would you be doing if you had access to all the resources and technology you needed? What if researchers were free to collaborate without any bureaucratic red tape? What if they were free to pursue their most ambitious ideas? What if we could make cancer immunotherapy a frontline treatment rather than a treatment of last resort? If cancer immunotherapy were cheaper and more accessible, how many people could we save? We are determined to find out. Thank you all for coming today.